Well, good to see all of you this evening, and those of you who are watching by live stream, you don't know what we just talked about. You're not in the room to see it. And, and so if you cannot come to church on Wednesday night Bible study, we understand. But those of you who can, you just missed a great thing. So next week, we expect to see you here. We'd love to have you. Uh, before we get started tonight, we're going to pray. And let's pray for several needs that we have in our body. Let's lift up the Hampson family, uh, Doug and Sarah Hampson. They have their daughters, and they're going through a struggle right now. Their oldest daughter and her husband uh, had a, a miscarriage, uh, their, their baby. And so they are really uh, struggling with that whole situation. Um, and just so you know, it was a, they had the gender reveal party, and the next day uh, they lost their baby. And so... Um, they're really needing our prayers. I shared all that information for one reason, to help you understand the need in that family right now for prayer. So please, I know that that just, it just doesn't it wrench your heart when you hear a story like that? Well, let's take that wrenching to the Lord in prayer. Also, let's remember Phyllis Haynes. Phyllis is here tonight, but her brother is struggling and brother, brother-in-law, I'm sorry. Her brother-in-law is struggling in Texas and, and will probably go home to be with the Lord very soon. And so she's heavy about that. And uh, her sister is heavy. And so uh, you'll probably head out that way, you said, to Texas towards the end of June. So let's keep Phyllis and her family, her, bro her brother-in-law and her sister in prayer. Also, uh, let's remember George Libanotti. Uh, George left the church on a, on a gurney Sunday, and then, of course, he was in the hospital for a couple days. He's home now. They have a home service coming in to minister, um, and so he's, I think he's going to be fine, but there's a little bit of time for recovery that he's going through, so we should see him here again pretty soon. I'm going to go visit with George tomorrow morning and spend a little time with him, so he and Phyllis could use our prayers at this time. It was heart-related, they believe, and so um, uh, he's getting care for that. Also, let's remember Shirley Morgan, who I think started her treatment today, and uh, she has, is it four or six treatments? Four treatments that she has to go through, and they spread them out quite a ways because they're pretty significant dosages of treatment, and so we need to keep Shirley in prayer. Obviously, anybody who's receiving treatment like that, uh, whether it be chemo or radiation or whatever type of uh, treatment, there are always side effects. And so let's just pray that God would minimize the effects uh, of, the, of the treatment, okay? Uh, spoke with Gail Dampier today, his wife Cindy, who had the cancer in her neck region, and uh, now she's completely healed by God. Uh, the doctors can't claim victory. Uh, God took care of it before they could really do anything about it. And that's, that's the joy of the Lord right there. That brings a smile over all of us. Yale said she's doing great and uh, has, the, has a little bit of a cold or something right now, but they're, they're doing wonderfully. So uh, that was a good report today as well. So we're going to get started and we're going to pray. Yes. Yes. Uh, that was about two weeks ago, wasn't it? Two or three weeks ago. Ed LaRue, uh, Ed lost his daughter, he and his wife, and they, they've been really heavy in their hearts for that, that loss. Thank you for the reminder. Let's, let's continue to lift them up to the Lord. And uh, I'm sure there are others, so there's always unspoken requests. But we have a God who knows everything. He knows everything. And so sometimes all we can do is say, Lord, we're just crying out to you for those that we're not aware of, those that we don't understand, knowing that you do, and asking you to uh, minister to them as well. Let's, let's pray. Father, we begin our class tonight by first acknowledging who you are. You are our creator. You made the human body. You designed it. You, you 
you created this world that we live in. You created everything on this earth. You created our galaxy and the billions upon billions of galaxies outside of it. And yet you also sent your son Jesus, the incarnate Christ, to come to be among us, your created beings. God Himself, the Creator, walking amongst us, understanding, identifying with our sufferings because He too was fully man, just as He was fully God. And so we come tonight knowing that these requests are not distant requests that we have to plead before you because you're unaware or you are unattentive to these needs. You know them better than we know them. You know the hearts of the people that are suffering and struggling right now. Every one of these situations matters to you. And we lift these requests to you, Lord, as your children, thanking you for being our God, a God who cares, a God who can't, comes near, who the Scripture says is near to the brokenhearted, a God who can heal us and does heal us from everything. Even through death, there's healing, ultimate healing, spending eternity with you in heaven. And tonight, we just lift these requests and the ones that we don't even know about that are in our body, that are in our families and our, amongst our friends, the request even of this church, the needs of this fellowship that has been so gracious to let us use their facility. We pray, God, that you would bless this church richly we thank you that no one was in this building when that tire came through the glass window. We are thankful for that. And we just pray that tonight, Lord, as we study your word, that we would come with the same appreciative heart as when we think about you, that now we would think the same way about the living word of God, that because you are immutable, your word is immutable. It will stand forever. And tonight, God, we live in a world where there is no absolute truth. There is no truth. Truth is what you make it to be. Truth is simply relative to whatever the focus is. That's, that's how the world thinks. That's how the world behaves. That's how they see truth. Yet we know there is absolute truth. We know there's a truth that's so pure, so true, that it will stand forever, the Scripture says. And so we, we pray that you'd help us apply this truth not only to our, our, not, our, our, our minds, but also our hearts, that as we go back out into this world, we can filter everything through the truth of the Word of God. We might look like oddballs to the world, but that's okay. We are children of the King. And we thank you for that privilege and honor that we did not deserve and that we did not merit or earn but you graciously gave us your Son, and you graciously called us to salvation. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, we're in 1 Kings chapter 10 tonight. It's not a long chapter. I debated on whether we want to go beyond chapter 10, and I chose not to. I'm going to try and make our full time out of chapter 10. I think there's enough here for us to consider. As, as we study the Word of God each week, if I can just say this to you, most of you know this, but maybe some of you wonder what our goal is, our aim, as we meet and do Bible study, whether it be Sunday morning or Wednesday night. The aim is to simply let the Scripture speak. The aim is not that I have some thoughts in my mind of things I want to say to the body, now let me find some scripture that will support what I want to say. That is, that is very poor exposition. That is called eisegesis. It's, it's taking out of the Bible what's not there. You're putting into the Bible. Exegesis, to exegete the text, is to exit from the Bible what the Bible is actually saying. It's the difference between... The news agencies today that tell you what they want you to hear, they create their own story versus finding somebody somewhere that just tells you what happened. 
They, they actually just report the news. Uh, that's the difference in, in rightly dividing the word of truth. The Bible does not need my help to make it work for you. If I help the Bible, I'm hurting you. The Bible stands on its own, and God, by the Holy Spirit, is here tonight to bring His Word alive into you. It's the bread of life. So let's be faithful to the Word tonight, as we try to do every time we meet. Uh, 1 Kings 10, as we come to chapter 10, we find Solomon at the height of both his piety and his prosperity. Uh, chapter 10, verse 1, this is the final chapter, folks, where we see this is almost like the zenith moment. This, it, 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 it summarizes the golden years of Israel under Solomon. Uh, this one chapter here. And, and it says in verse 1, Now when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to test him with hard questions. So let's, let's look at that. The queen of Sheba, which was located probably, there, there's a question whether, uh, it, but most scholars will say it was actually, you know, obviously uh, in Yemen. Um, and the queen of Sheba came probably 1,200 to 1,500 miles that's about a 75-day journey by camelback. Can you imagine riding on a camel for 75 days? <laughs> 1,500 miles. And uh, so she comes all the way to Israel, to Jerusalem, to meet with Solomon. But look what it says. She heard of the fame of Solomon... In what area? Concerning the name of the Lord. Up to this point in time, everything that Solomon has done, everything that has been spoken of Israel under Solomon's leadership, he has been very quick to give God all the glory for it. He recognizes it was the Lord who gave him the wisdom and discernment that he asked for. It was the Lord who went beyond what he asked for and gave him wealth and gave him fame. And this is what's happening. The, God's promise to Solomon came true because now people are coming from great distances, kings and queens and whoever, in order to be next to Solomon, to listen to him uh, as he would uh, uh, teach or as he would speak because he was so wise and to see what God had done. Now, that doesn't mean that Sheba, the queen of Sheba, uh, received, uh, converted to Judaism. It just says that she had a great fear for God. That's basically what it means here. We'll look into that further as we go. If I could say this about uh, modern-day Yemen, where probably she came from, you're talking about southern Arabia. Okay, uh, we know from geography that this was a very wealthy kingdom that she came from. We know as we read the text that she comes bearing gifts. It was an area with great amounts of gold and spices. And even more importantly than just having the great spices, Yemen had the, the knowledge, the understanding of how to process the spices. She brought all of that with her, okay, when she came to visit. Uh, now, the question that we, we, we definitely want to ask is, why did the queen of Sheba come and visit Solomon? And I could give you several answers. I already gave you one. But the primary reason for coming is because God said to Israel from the beginning, long before Solomon came along, and even during Solomon's reign, that he wanted to raise up a people for himself, Israel, who would make his name great on the earth. God wanted all nations to know him, to know who he was. He wanted Israel to be the picture of a nation that is blessed by God. And so that's why she's coming. She's heard of the greatness of God. 
He's heard about this God. Uh, what was the takeaway of her, her visit? What did she go home thinking or feeling or knowing? Well, verse 2 kind of helps us understand and, under, uh, and know this. She came to Jerusalem with a great, great, with a very great retinue uh, or entourage. So she came with probably over 100 people uh, with camels bearing spices and very much gold and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she told him all that was on her mind. And Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing hidden from the king that he could not explain to her. Things that the queen, who had her own court of very highly intelligent people from every field of study, who could not give her answers for things she was asking, and she travels to Jerusalem, and Solomon gives her answers for all of it. More than that, she tried to use riddles to, to you know, mess him up a little bit. And she was unsuccessful. In every way, he had greater understanding, greater wisdom, and greater discernment. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food of his table, the seating of his officials, and the attendance of his servants, their clothing, his cupbearers, and his burnt offerings that he offered at the house of the Lord, there was no more breath in her. The queen was obviously familiar with the world of royal splendor and luxury. She came from it, yet she was completely overwhelmed by the wisdom of Solomon and the glory of the kingdom that God had established through Solomon. I want you to remember when we learn back towards the beginning of 1 Kings that how much food had to be prepared for Solomon and his court. It took a whole, he had 12 different people, leaders, who there, he picked them by geography, different regions. They had 11 months to store up, to harvest all the food that would be given to Solomon and his family over the course of one month. You think about all the food you could acquire in an 11-month period. Now, they were agrarian people, so we're not talking about going to Publix. But all the food that they could, that they could grow, all the cattle that they, could, that they could raise, all the meat, all the veggies, everything, the fruits, took 11 months to acquire enough to feed his, his family, his court, his servants, and their families. For one month. We're talking about more than you could ever really imagine. I mean, to us, that's like, that's, that's crazy that, that somebody would need that much food, we would think. Um, remember what the purpose is in this story. God wants his name to be great. He told Solomon, if you will be faithful to me and obey me, and you will worship me and me alone, I will make you great, and I will bless you in every way fathomable. God kept his promise. So there's something here for others to see, these other nations. If you, if you worship the one true God, you will be blessed. That's the message that God's sending out. So uh, if I could just say one day, one, let's break it down. We talked about enough provision for one month. Let's, let's go to one day. 300 bushels of fine flour for one day. 600 bushels of meal. 10 fat oxen. 10 oxen for one day. 20 oxen out of the pastures or 10 choice grade and 20 commercial grade beef. So 10 of the finest beef and 20 of the commercial grade beef. A hundred sheep besides the hearts. This is a day. This is not a month. This is for one day. Roe bucks, fallow, or fallow deer, fatted fowl. This was the daily requirement. 
to feed Solomon's uh, people. Uh, this is what the Queen of Sheba saw. She knows what opulence is. She knows what the finest is. She had never seen anything like this. Uh, the golden tables. Every placement on the table is covered in gold or solid gold. Solomon, they had so much wealth. Get this. They took ivory. They would use carvings made of ivory to make different things like short swords and shields, not for battle, for looks. And they would cover ivory with gold. What's the value of ivory today? And you would never cover it with gold. We're, we're talking opulence. And yet, it, this is not prosperity preaching. God never said that I'll do the same for everybody on the earth. He made a special covenant with Israel through Solomon. So we can't translate this and say, well, this is how God wants to bless you. You should have five houses. You should have 20 cars. You should have... It's ridiculous how man takes the Bible. That's eisegesis. That's taking from the text what doesn't exist. That's man putting his thoughts into the text. So, uh, she's so taken by all of this that she doesn't have words. She couldn't even catch her breath. It actually says that there was no breath in her. <laughs> it's like she got gut punched, you know? You get the air knocked out of you. She was taken by the whole thing. Verse 6, and she said to the king, the report was true that I heard in my own land of your words and of your wisdom, but I did not believe the reports. What I heard about you was incredible, and I didn't believe it was even possible. Now, now listen to what she says. Here's the takeaway. And, and I, until I came and my own eyes had seen it, and behold, the half was not told me. Even with everything they said about you and about the land, they only gave me half the story. Your wisdom and prosperity surpass the report that I heard. Happy are your men. Happy are your servants who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord your God who has delighted in you and set you on the throne of Israel because the Lord loved Israel forever. He has made you king that you may execute justice and righteousness. Wow. She is getting a full first-hand view of the one true and living God through Solomon. She basically said that the whole thing is beyond any splendor, majesty, power that exists on the face of the earth, and your people are so blessed to have you as king and to have God as their God. And she blesses the Lord here. We're talking about a pagan blessing the Lord Solomon's God. Now, no doubt, at this point in his life, Solomon was still walking with the Lord and honoring God because, because she saw the way he ascended to the holy temple and worshipped God, making sacrifice to God. She saw the whole thing. Some pastors have taken this portion of the passage and come to the conclusion that she was converted, that now she believed in the one true and living God. It doesn't say that. We, we know that she we, it doesn't say anything. There's no indication that she herself made sacrifice to God. Even though she saw, that's what you do if you are practicing their religion. You make a blood sacrifice to God. It doesn't say she made a sacrifice. She watched Solomon make his sacrifice. Okay? Uh, Jesus said this. Let your light so shine before men that when they see your good works, they will what? Glorify your Father who is in heaven. Solomon is doing that. He's doing that. If Sheba never, never came to a point of believing in, converting to, and denying all other gods and worshiping only the one true God, she has no excuse when she died and stood before God. No excuse. No excuse. 
because he modeled what it looks like to worship the one true God. Do we do that every day? Opportunities every day to show this world. We're not doing it as a show. We're not doing it as a, as a it's, you're not actors. It's real. But are you allowing what's real in you? What is the, what's real in you? The light of Christ. And he says, I'm going to make you the light of the world. You're not, you're not the light. You're a lamp that I'm going to let burn that people might see me. Is that happening? Not hiding it under a bushel like the little song. No, I'm going to let it shine, right? We, we want our kids to sing it. Do we practice it? I can tell you this, more than the child, a child learning that song is a child seeing a mom and dad who model what the song says. Amen? That's what it's about. Now, again, uh, we don't think she was converted. There's nothing here that indicates that. She might have been impressed and feared God, but not at the exclusion of all others. She probably still had her own gods that she worshipped. Now, back to Solomon. The king was hitting on all cylinders at this point. God had given him the means and he is using every means to the full glory of God. Isn't that wonderful? I wish that the story would, would, would if you read this up to this point in the chapter, you're going, man, this is going to be a glorious ending to his life at some point. Uh, far from it. Things change. He will lapse in his worship of God until finally he is worshiping other gods and allowing people in the kingdom of God to worship other gods. That's how far uh, Solomon will fall. So why did the Lord bless Solomon to this degree? To make his name great. We've established that. Uh, but we also, this is interesting to me. God has created Solomon to be a vessel that he can flow through to show his greatness, to bless others. Um, it didn't end well. We would say Solomon messed up God's plan. And we would be right in this part of that statement. Solomon didn't fulfill what God called him to do. You would be wrong in thinking that God's plan failed. You'd be wrong in thinking, well, I'm sure God has a backup plan. If Solomon doesn't carry it out, God's got a backup plan. You'd be wrong thinking that. You want the truth? The truth is, long before God chose Solomon, he knew exactly how things would play out and that Solomon would not fulfill. And God didn't need a backup plan. That was part of God's plan. Man has to fail in his own ability to worship God so that man will then see only God can save him. And what I'm telling you is, in the Garden of Eden, God creates man after his own image. And he puts in the heart of man and woman the ability to choose. He gave them the opportunity to follow him, to have sweet fellowship with him in the cool of the day, the Bible says. But he also told them, don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He didn't not put the tree there so they wouldn't do evil. People wonder, why did God even put the tree there then? To tempt man. He didn't tempt man. That tree needed to be there. It's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But man chose to eat of it. Had God forced man in some way, shape, or form not to eat of it, I guess now man doesn't have the choice whether he wants to love God or not. Now man is forced to worship God. God did not design man to be forced into worship. 
a baby's born, a baby gets a little older, <clears throat> becomes a child, and the child says to mom and dad, I want to worship God. Because God wired them to say that. <laughs> How ridiculous is that? God said, no, I gave you my image. You have the capacity to establish a will and carry out my will. Or you can choose to carry out your own will. And if you choose to follow me, then I'll bless you. And not everybody chooses that. But God knew while he created man before man ever sinned, he knew that he would send the second person of the Trinity to die on the cross for the sins of man. Adam didn't mess up God's plan in the garden. Adam actually helps fulfill God's plan to show us that we are sinners and that we could never earn the love of God. God himself has to die. That's why in Genesis chapter 22, you're talking just what, 18 chapters later, 19 chapters later. And God says through Abraham, he said, I myself will, or God himself will provide the sacrifice. He said that to Isaac. That's prophetic. And did you know that Abraham was a prophet? Read chapter 20. The prophet Abraham. And God gave a prophecy through Abraham to his son Isaac. When Isaac asked, where's the sacrifice? God himself will provide. Isn't that something? All of this fits God's. God is sovereign, church family. He's sovereign in everything. I want to say this with a great deal of sensitivity and, and care as a shepherd, but I want, to be, I want to be straightforward as I say it. When you face a life crisis, and you're not sure where God is. That, that you're not wrong for having that thought enter your mind. That's going to happen, right? That's just part of it. But I'm going to tell you right now, if you've been saying your whole life that God is sovereign, that He sees and knows everything, and He has a plan in everything, what are you doing? Losing hope in God and falling away from the Lord because of a crisis in your life. As a shepherd, I want to walk over and I want to, I want to just grab you and shake you and say, either He is what He said He was, and that you have said that He is all these years, or He's not. And if He is, then you need to remember that right now. Don't live in this place where all of a sudden the enemy sows seeds of question and doubt about God. Again, you're not wrong for having that initial thought. That's life. You know, when, when something bad happens, it's, it's, it's okay to feel fear, to feel pain, to feel sorrow, to feel doubt. Those things happen. Don't live there. I'm talking about the person who had a crisis and now they no longer believe God the way they used to believe Him. That's what I'm talking about. Now they can't recover from the crisis. Either one of two things is true. Either they never really believed that He was sovereign and that He has a plan through everything. Or they believed it, but they've taken their eyes off of Him. And they've allowed other things to control their thinking. They become double-minded in all that they do. And James said that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. He's double-minded. This is a very difficult teaching. Again, I don't share this with uh, pride or arrogance or looking down. or con I'm not trying to condescend here. I'm trying to help you when you're not in a crisis. 
to prepare for the crisis. And the crisis will come. For some of you, it's already come. And you're probably going to have more than one in your lifetime. And it could happen to me tonight. But I've got to believe that God is sovereign and that God has a plan and His plan was not thwarted because something happened in my life that's a huge crisis and now the whole world is upside down and wrong. God is still in control. Always. No matter what happens in life. He wants us to live there. Now, again, feelings, temptations to doubt and fear are real. And you can have a moment where that, that feeling is there. Nobody's, getting, nobody's perfect in this, right? Just don't let it become your life. Don't live there. Remember who your God is. Get back to who your God is. Don't turn from Scripture. Turn to Scripture and see the greatness of your God. Amen? Okay. <clears throat> it just cost me a pound of flesh, I think, and I, I could use about, lose about 50 pounds and be... I can do that 49 more times. <laughs> okay. Um, verse 10, Then she gave the king 120 talents of gold and a very great quantity of spices and precious stones. Never again came such an abundance of spices as these that the Queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. And again, she came from this rich spice region, and she had the men and the women who were skilled in processing these great spices. Verse 11, moreover, the fleet of Hiram. Remember, Hiram is the king of Syria. And, and from the beginning, Solomon has had a strong alliance with the Syrian king which brought gold from Ophir. We're not really sure where Ophir is. He brought from Ophir a gr very great amount of almug wood and precious stones. I forget the name of the tree, almug. There's another name that we would use today, but it was a type of wood. I don't know even if there's any left in the world, but uh, people say it was a type of wood that on the outside, it was black. The bark was a black. Uh, and then you cut it if you can. It's very, very dense. And inside is a ruby red wood, a beautiful decorative wood, okay? So he brought this almig wood and he brought precious stones. Uh, <clears throat> let me just say it. We're going we're gonna to see it further down the text but uh, because we, we already talked about this. But he also commissioned uh, Hiram to build a navy to gather these resources necessary for the building of the palace and the temple. And so there were, there, there were two navies in Solomon's life that he established, okay? Uh, one traveled the waters of the Persian Gulf and down to the east coast of Africa, which would be the Ivory Coast, uh, where the second navy went out of the Mediterranean and covered a, a, a map, well, all the Mediterranean to the point that they would even go as far as England. They brought back, it says later in the text, that they would bring back Peacock uh, to Solomon. So you're talking two navies that have missions. You know, they're under, under secret order, you know, and they go out and they, they bring these things from afar. They would be gone for months at a time and come back. But he so blessed Solomon with the knowledge of how to do it and what to do. It was just beyond anything on the earth. Verse 12, and the king made of the Alma wood supports for the house of the Lord and for the king's house, also lyres and harps for the singers. So this was a very important type of wood that was used. I'll bet it, was, I'll bet it made a beautiful harp, you know? I'll bet these instruments were just, with the craftsmanship and all, beautiful. No such Alma wood has come or been seen to this day. Wow, interesting. And King Solomon gave to the queen of Sheba all that she desired, whatever she asked besides what was given her by the bounty of King Solomon. So she turned and went back to her own land with her servants. This is what the Bible says about Sheba, queen of, the queen of Sheba and Solomon and their relationship. Fable has it that Solomon also impregnated her, which would strengthen an alliance with her people. Nothing in Scripture about that. There's a lot of fables, right? And so 
Just throwing that out there because guaranteed you can, you'll get into discussion with somebody about this study that you had, and they're going to bring that up. Well, what about the fact that he got her pregnant? What about the, um, well, that's not in the Bible. That's all you got to say. Uh, it's a fable. Okay, verse 14, now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year, in one year was 666 talents of gold. How much gold is that? That's about 25 tons of gold. That's his base salary. Three billion eight hundred million. Thank you, Ron. That's that's his. Hey, that's his base salary. Almost four billion dollars, just shy of four billion dollars, for one year. Four billion, almost four billion a year. Now put, I mean, just think about what the cost of a living was back in that day and Solomon getting acquiring that much. Think about the cost of a living today and making $4 billion, okay? You wouldn't, that $4 billion wouldn't go nearly as far as it did back in his day, okay? So pretty, that's pretty awesome, Ron. Thanks for sharing that with us. Good stuff. Uh, <clears throat> for those of you online, Jerry just asked Ron, did you make that up, Ron? <laughs> Nope, it's true. That's right. Okay, verse 15. Besides that which came from the explorers and from the businesses of the merchants and from all the kings of the west and from the governors of the land. So gold came to, uh, came to Solomon from tolls and tariffs, from traders, revenues from loyal administrators, taxes from Arabian kings who used caravan routes under Solomon's control. I mean, this guy had it rolling. Solomon, verse 16, made 200 large shields of beaten gold. 600 shekels of gold went into each shield, and he made 300 shields of beaten gold. Three uh, minas of gold went into each shield, and the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. Remember back when he was building his house, he built a whole large courtyard area, room, that had these, these golden shields that were, it was, called the, it was called the Forest of Lebanon. These beautiful structures in that room. That's what he's built here. Now, these were not shields that they would use for battle. He did not build these for his army because it's gold. And that would never hold up in a battle. This is all decorative. This is all part of the splendor of the greatness of God on display. Okay? Uh, by the way, I, th I thought about this today. This shows Solomon had the image of a warrior king, but he wasn't a warrior king. Okay, He might have looked like one, but he didn't have the substance. Remember what God said to David who wanted to build the, the, the temple? No, you're the warrior king. You've got blood on your hands. I'll let your son, who doesn't have blood on his hands, build the house of the Lord. So I'm not saying that Solomon was trying to put off the image that he's the warrior king, but he is certainly saying that Israel is a formidable army to deal with. While he didn't build their weaponry out of this, they did have weapons. They had horses and chariots as well. Israel never had horses and chariots. They were farming people. They had hoes. They had shovels. They had picks. And now all of a sudden, Solomon has brought a zenith moment to Israel. Okay, Verse 18, the king also made a great ivory throne and overlaid it with the finest gold. The throne had six steps and the throne had a round top. And on each side of the seat were armrests and two lions standing beside the armrests. Could you imagine coming into the presence of Solomon sitting on that throne? While 12 lions stood there, one on each end of a step on the six steps. The like of it was never made in any kingdom. Can you imagine when Queen of Sheba came walking into that throne room, huh? Man, into that hall. All King Solomon's drinking vessels were of gold, and all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were pure gold. None were of silver. Why? Silver was not considered as anything in the days of Solomon. The value, here's what it means. Because there was so much gold, it drove the value of silver down to nothing. 
He saw silver like sand. That's how much gold he had. Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 15. I want to take you back. Turn there if you will. Let's go read it together. Deuteronomy chapter 28. We'll start at verse 1. Because right about now, you're probably thinking, man, why would he need all that stuff? And what man, what king needs, what kingdom needs to have that kind of wealth? 28, verse 1. Yep, chapter 28 of Deuteronomy, verse 1. It says, and if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all His commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. Who's doing the setting up? God. Who wants Israel to look different than everybody else? God. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. If you obey the voice of the Lord your God, blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb, and the fruit of your ground, and the fruit of your cattle, the increase of your herds, and the young of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall be when it shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. Look at this. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to go be to, to be defeated before you. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing on you in your barns and in all of your under and all that you undertake. And you, he will bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. The Lord will establish you as a people holy to himself as he was sworn to you if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in His ways. Listen, church, it was all about holiness. It was all about being known as God's people. You can't be His people if you're not holy. And God's saying that's the, that's the trigger of this whole thing. If you're not holy, I'm not going to bless you like this. If you look at the prosperity gospel being taught in the world today, it's, it's the perversion of that. They start with what you can have, the prosperity, the wealth, the money, the houses, the cars, the, the gold. A group of pastors who literally uh, would wear these $1,000, $2,000 tennis shoes when they would preach and take, take shots and put it on Twitter. I forget what it was called, uh, Preachers in Sneakers. And it became a national thing, and all these people, all these young people, checking out, check out my preacher, what he wears to show off the prosperity of the wealth. These shoes, by the way, came from Payless shoes or something, I don't know. Cir <laughs> Circus world. <laughs> so, so the perversion is, let's go for the wealth. Let's not think about the holiness. Did you know that those who preach the prosperity message are constantly being found and indicted for illegal activity? Constantly. There's a, there's a connection. So don't talk to me about the Bible teaching prosperity the way it's taught today. The Bible didn't teach it that way. Verse 10, and all the peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by my name of the Lord, by the name of the Lord. See that? There it is. And they shall be afraid of you because of my name. And the Lord will make you abound in prosperity in the fruit of your womb and in the fruit of your livestock, in the fruit of your ground and within, within the, the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open to you his good treasury, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hands. And you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. Is that not a picture of Solomon's kingdom? And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. And you shall only go up and not down. This is the, the, the pinnacle of this promise in covenant given in Deuteronomy came true in 1 Kings chapter 10. And here it is in verse 13. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, being careful to do them, 
And if you do not turn aside from any of the words that I command you today, to the right hand or to the left, to go after other gods to serve them. In this day, the world believes in futility. And they don't even know it. Foolishness. I'm talking people that are degreed. And they're fools for what they believe. And the Bible says here to his people, and think about yourself in this. And if you do not turn aside from any of the words that I command you today, don't ever turn aside from the words of the Bible and listen to fools. Don't be taken by this fallen world and what it has to offer you. It's not worth it. It's just not worth it. I, I gave you the book last week by C.J. Mahaney called Worldliness. Sandy actually went out and, and bought the book, and she's been reading it, and she's just blown away by it. You don't realize, I don't realize, how much we allow the world to come into us. It's a great read. It's a very small book, too. It's not a, not a tough read. Let me give you another book that I gave her, two, two other books that I gave her. Write these down. You'll, you'll be blessed if you read them. You'll be blessed. Another one's written by a great pastor. His name is A.W. Tozer, T-O-Z-E-R. And it's called The Pursuit of God. If you want to get back on track with God, read that book. The other book is a great devotional book. Oh, easy read, fun read. It's a great book to pick up as you get in your bed at night and have your lamp on and just read it before you go to sleep. It's called The God of All Things. It's written by Andrew Wilson, The God of All Things. If you really want to begin each morning in prayer, you never want to start prayer without first starting with worship of God, right? Read a chapter. He takes subjects that are in the Bible, pigs, dust. I mean, the most common subjects that are weird, honey. And he lays out a devotional on what the Scripture says about these things. It will blow your mind. It's a beautiful book, a great book. It will increase your desire for worship of God the God of all things. These are not books that transcend the Bible. They are below the Bible, right? Not even close. But they are about the Bible. They'll help you as you walk through this fallen, crooked world. Verse 15, But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God, or be careful to do all His commandments and His statutes that I command you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. And we're not going to go into it, but he lists all the curses. God offers the best and says, if you choose to do it your own way, then you'll get the rest. You won't get the best. And the rest will never get you to heaven. Verse 22, back in our text, For the king had a fleet of ships of Tarshish at sea with the fleet of Hiram. So there's the, there's the two fleets. Once every three years, the fleet of ships of Tarshish used to come bringing gold, silver, ivory, Apes and peacocks. <laughs> Gone for three years at a time. So they're traveling great distances. All the way up into the Norwegian region. Thus King Solomon excelled all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom. And the whole earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom which God had put in his mind. See there again. It's Solomon has the wisdom, but God's the one who put it there. How did they know that? Because that's what Solomon told them. It was not about him. It was about God. Verse 25, every one of them brought the, his present uh, articles of silver and gold, garments, myrrh, spices, horses, mules, so much by, year by year came to Solomon. So he had the base salary of almost $4 billion, and then he had all these blessings on top of it. The wisdom of, of God that God gave Solomon caused many rulers, like the Queen of Sheba, to bring presents to the Lord. 
And these gifts led Solomon to multiply for himself many things. Now here's where things go south. So we're at the zenith, okay? We're, we're, this is the Camelot of Israel under Solomon, okay? Now, um, by the way, we talk about the Camelot era of America when John F. Kennedy was president, right? Camelot. Uh, think about that Camelot, and I'll think about this Camelot. Is there any comparison? When truly God is the Lord. Man, oh man, oh man. Wow. So, verse 26, here we go, the beginning of the end. And Solomon gathered together chariots and horsemen. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen, whom he stationed in the chariot cities and with the king in Jerusalem. So Solomon had 1,400 chariots, 12,000 horsemen. Uh, in comparison to the true warrior King David, who had zero chariots and turned away from horses. Why? Remember when David was counting the battle, he was counting the cost of the battle, and he sent out his men and find out how, mon how many horses they have. And God came to David and said, uh, it doesn't matter how many horses they have. And God led him into defeat. And from that day forward, Israel stopped counting horses. Well, somebody forgot about that. Somebody's turning away from God. By the way, Israel to this day, Solomon's not the great king of Israel. Never has been noted as that. He's the wealthiest, the wisest. I mean, he amassed more than David ever could. He's not known as the greatest. David is known as the greatest. Why? Because David had a heart after God. Even when David was drifting and committing sin, yet he never turned to other gods. Solomon turns to other gods. Big difference. So, verse 27, uh, And the king made silver as common as Jerusalem, or as common in Jerusalem as stone, and he made cedar as plentiful as the sycamore of the Shepha. Uh, don't forget that the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon gave an eloquent testimony to the vanity of riches. He did a good job with that, by the way. He showed very powerfully how there's no ultimate satisfaction in materialism because he had everything. He had all the materialism, and he said, that's not the answer. And he also said, I've done more things than anybody else, and yet there's nothing new that I've ever done that's under the sun. It, it's all vanity. It's all it amounts to nothing. So you'd think that Solomon would end well. He didn't. Verse 28, and Solomon, Solomon's import of horses was from Egypt and Q. And the king's traders received them from Ku at a price. Ku, by the way, was in Cilicia, which would be up in Asia Minor, the area that we're studying. It was just west, or east of where we're studying uh, the Apostle Paul on his first missionary journey, above Syria and east of Syria. Uh, in ancient times, uh, Cilicia was said to breed, or Q was said to breed and sell the best horses. And Solomon's import of horses was from Egypt. At the end of the great description of Solomon's wealth and splendor, we have the sound of this dark time that's coming. Now all of a sudden, he's, got a, he's investing in horses. He's doing it under the cover that I'm buying these horses for others, for other kings. I'm simply the trader. Um, every, every great evil starts out with reasoning that it's okay. It's a little thing. It's not a big deal. Not a big deal. But it grows. I was shocked this week to listen to The World and Everything in It. It's a wonderful podcast. If you're not listening to that, what's wrong with you? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's phenomenal. And I no longer watch uh, news agencies on TV. I, I don't watch any of them. But the world and everything, and it's a biblical worldview of the news. They just report the news. Um, but they reported that uh, the Church of Scotland just changed their, they voted that same-sex couples could be married in the Church of Scotland. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the Church of Scotland. This was the bastion 
of reform. You're talking John Knox. You're talking about a church that held to the authority of Scripture and nothing else. And back 20 years ago, they began opening the door to have homosexual priests. But you don't stop there. Now, they can provide weddings for anybody of any type, any identity at all. They can do the wedding in the church at Scotland. Another great bastion of biblical truth has fallen. It's happening all the time, and it's happening around the globe. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, Jerry, let me say it because of the live stream. They couldn't hear, and many of you couldn't. That uh, uh, one of the former pastors at First Church of God, Ken Long, his son, yeah, Stuart, Stuart uh, actually did his study over in Scotland. And uh, at, today now in, in that area, uh, 2% now claim Christianity out of a nation that was fueled by the fire of God and the Word of God. Okay, so here we see Solomon taking a, a, a new course. He's in direct disobedience to Deuteronomy 17, 16. Write that down, Deuteronomy 17, 16. Let me, let me give it to you. Only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. Well, he is returning, okay? A chariot, verse 9, 29, a chariot could be imported from Egypt for 600 shekels of silver and a horse for 150. And so through the king's traders, they were exported to all the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Syria. By the way, the Hittites, it says the kings of Hittites, plural. Hittites were from Asia Minor. They, they really were strong between 1720 and 1200 BC. They were a unified kingdom. They were at their zenith around uh, 1380, 1350 in that ballpark, that 30 year period. And then they collapsed at 1200 BC. But, but they had all these smaller cities and so they're called the kings of the Hittites. And this was the period of time when Solomon was ruling, okay? So Solomon is the man at this point. And uh, under the influence of the wisdom and power of God, he has done exceedingly what any other person on the face of the earth has ever done. Uh, but we're going to turn to chapter 11 next week, and now we sing a different song. Mm. If I can just give you a little uh, tidbit going into next week. Let me read verse 1 for you, maybe up to verse 5 or 6. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonite, Hittite women from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall, you, shall, they, uh, shall they with you. For surely they will turn away from your heart after their own gods. Okay, Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives who were princes, princesses and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the, ab the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not wholly follow the Lord as, da his David, as David his father had done. And Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites on the mountain east of Jerusalem. And so he did for all his foreign wives who made offerings and sacrificed to their gods. Oh, my goodness. We're going to go into all that next week and learn how easy it is to fall into worldliness 
and we too have to guard and protect. I this week I, I don't use uh, cable new, uh, cable uh, networking. I, I use internet for the television, and I saw where uh, you know you uh, the the Hallmark movies that were so good, and now they've opened the door to anything and everything. And Candace Bure, or it used to be Candace Cameron from Full House. Uh, she and her brother Kirk Cameron, good solid Christian people, and Cam uh, sh she actually, uh, Candace left Hallmark. She was one of the early actresses that really helped make that whole thing work. And uh, a couple years ago, the CEO of of uh, I don't know what the name of the company is, but it produced the Hallmark Channel. And uh, they started introducing, pushing for these things, and he left the company. And she has now left, and so have other actors and actresses. And they, this, this CEO has created a new, um, a new uh, app, a new channel that you can get for movies and TV shows that are wholesome. It's called GAC. And it's basically, they're, they're not going to give in to the ways of the world. And so, uh, you know, we're trying to set up that so that we have that to, to watch. You, you've got to take extreme measures. Otherwise, you get sucked into all the other crap. Really, it's, it's just terrible. What a mess. Hey, let's close in prayer, and, and let's, let's lift up the Supreme Court as they consider... Uh, returning to a pro-life position. Father, we do lift up uh, the Supreme Court. We know that the enemy is speaking try as loud as he can, trying to threaten, trying to pressure, trying to intimidate. But God, I pray that you would give those on the court who are God-fearing, and they're not all God-fearing necessarily. I don't know. I, I don't know any of them personally, but some of the positions that they hold would tell me that they don't fear the Lord. But there are those who do, and I pray that they would stand strong in the face of opposition and that you would return this nation to a position that we respect and that we provide safety and security for both the mom and the baby in the womb. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.